Bye, Janet. It's nice seeing you See again. You, soon. you look good, girl. Just let me know what I can do to help. Well, to help me, she'd have to help every day. Every hour, every ouch, every time my wife calls for help. I mean, maybe she could help me make her lunch. But the crust, all the crust has to be cut off the corners. She could help me run to the doctor for the fifth time this week. Help me with the specialist and the second opinions and the painful paperwork about paperwork. Help me deal with how hard it is seeing my wife's name on so much paperwork. But this is on me. I'm the only one who can do this, like this, for her. Besides, Take care. we will. <laughs> Janet doesn't like her cooking anyway. Find support for your strength. Visit aarp.org slash caregiving for care guides and community. Good morning. Good morning and welcome to the 15th annual City of Cleveland Disability Awareness Day and Luncheon. We are really delighted that you have joined us today. My name is Mary McNamara, and I'm the Director of Aging for the City of Cleveland. The Department of Aging is an aging and disability resource center right here in the City of Cleveland, and we're proud to be part of the Aging and Disability Resource Network. I also want to welcome you to Fairhill Partners. I want to thank Ivory of Cleveland Hearing and Speech for joining us today. At the Department of Aging, we partner regularly with Fairhill programs, Fairhill partners around programs like Matter of Balance, the Senior Guest House, the Aging and Disability Resource Center programs. How many people are here at Fairhill Partners for the first time today? Oh good, well welcome. I worked back here in 2000 and it was then that I learned that this building is shaped like an anchor. It was built as a merchant marine hospital. And then many people might remember it as Fairhill Psychiatric Hospital. And then about 30 years ago, University Hospitals and Benjamin Rose came together and created Fairhill Partners, a campus for successful aging. And we're always glad at the city to bring programs here. We um, began the Senior Guest House, which was the first homeless shelter in the state of Ohio, right here on the campus of Fairhill Partners. So a few housekeeping items as we begin. First, restrooms are located on either side of this room. Women's restroom is behind me. Men's restroom is on the opposite side of the wall through the doors. Secondly, if you need assistance today, Team Aging is wearing blue senior walk shirts. We can help you with seat accommodations closer to the front, audio listening devices, and more. Just please raise your hand if we can be of any assistance. Lastly, did anyone not get a lunch when they came in? If you didn't, we've got a couple of folks. Go ahead and um, raise your hand. And I'll have Ursula right here and Emma. Take note of anyone who doesn't have a lunch and we'll bring one to you. Please feel free to keep eating throughout the program. We call this a lunch and learn. We're delighted. We've got a full house today. We actually had to tell people they couldn't come when they called after the deadline date. So next year, if you have friends who want to come and colleagues, um, encourage them to register early. But we're delighted that the program will air on TV20. And so Ralston and Dan Monroe from TV20 will video record this program so you can tune in later and invite friends to do as well. When you checked in at registration, you got a bag, a green bag. We filled that with some resources from the Department of Aging. The Cleveland Site Center put some resources on the table. We have some great vendors outside. We hope you leave with a bag of resources and if you don't need them, please share them with someone else. I bring you greetings from Mayor Jackson, the 56th mayor of the city of Cleveland. Unfortunately, he's not able to be with us today, um, but I'm confident he'll tune in on TV20 for this program. Um, I also just want to acknowledge um, several guests in the audience that we're delighted have um, joined us. Um, representing Congresswoman Marsha Fudge's office, is uh, Mr. Pittman. Mr. Pittman, can you raise your hand? 
Thank you for joining us on behalf of the Congresswoman. We appreciate her support. Also from Mayor Jackson's uh, office, we have Ms. McDougal and Ms. Camper who are here in the, off in the audience. We're, yes, welcome. We're thrilled that from um, the Cleveland Police Department, Officer Sutton and Officer Lewis and Detective Callahan are here in the back. So thank you, Cleveland Police, for being here today. Also, I want to um, acknowledge that there are several executive assistants from council members' office. So Ms. Denton from Ms. Hairst Mr. Hairston's ward, Councilman Hairston, and uh, Ms. Deskins from Councilman Bishop. We're delighted that you are here today, thank you. So we've got a full house, we're glad everyone is here. And I wanna tell you, we, while we always strive to have this event in October, this year the date is really important. If you didn't know, today is National White Cane Day. Cleveland Site Center will tell you more about that, but it's why we chose October 15th. According to the World Health Organization, around 285 million people around the world have a visual impairment, a figure which includes 39 million people who are blind. So White Cane Day has been around since the 30s, but we've still got so much more to learn about it. But we are pleased to pause on this day to learn, to celebrate, and to be inspired. In 2011, President Obama declared October 15th Blind Americans Equality Day as well. So October 15th, mark it, right, on your calendar. How many people is this your first uh, Disability Day luncheon with us? Oh, great, great, oh my goodness, about half the group, that's great. Well, we always try and keep it moving. We've got entertainment and performance and learning. And at this time, I'd like to, um, while you're eating your lunch, hope that you'll enjoy some musical entertainment. And I'd like to introduce Mr. Eddie Bacchus Sr. and Myla Burton to you. Sounds like some people know them. Yeah. Mr. Bacchus might not need much introduction, but Councilman Conwell introduced us to him. Widely regarded on the Jazz Fest site, I read, the Jazz Fest Cleveland site, as a standard bearer of Cleveland jazz, virtuoso organist Eddie Bacchus Sr. has been a leader, mentor, and the soul of the local jazz scene since the early 60s. Blind nearly from birth, he would become the only professional musician among his 10 siblings. Joining him today is Myla Burton, and we're delighted they're gonna offer both a, um, a patriotic tune and an inspirational tune to get our program started. So, welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to start with an inspirational tune. Um, Mr. Eddie Bacchus and I, uh, we're gonna do something I'm sure you're all familiar with. It is Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. But now 
join us. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. something um, we hope you'll enjoy. Patriotic. <laughs> While the storm clouds gather far across the sea let us swear enjoy the program with us. I also want to give a thank you. We've had so many volunteers who've made this day possible, both at the Cleveland Site Center. I know there were six standout volunteers today really helping us. The Cleveland Department of Aging team. So thank you to all who made this possible.
So the history of the, our luncheon today is that each year, the Department of Aging reaches out to one of our trusted partners in the Aging and Disability Resource Network to join us in planning this Lunch and Learn celebration. Each year, this event is one of the highlights for our team, and this year is no different. For the last several months, we've been working with the staff of the Cleveland Site Center, and we've learned so much, been enlightened, and challenged and we wish the same for you today. I know as more people come in the room, I just wanna pause. If you have an extra seat at your table, as people are on the outside, if you could raise your hand. For those, if you'd like to sit at a table, we've got seats probably all around, if you see that, that you could join us at the table. Thank you for that. So as we learn a little bit more about the Cleveland Site Center and our hope for you today, I'd like to invite forward Mr. Larry Benders. He's the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Cleveland Site Center. He was formerly the Director of Development for Cuyahoga County and the first Executive Director for the Workforce Development Board, a joint effort between the City of Cleveland and Cuyahoga County that provides job placement opportunities. Today, he leads the efforts of the Cleveland Site Center that has been a resource and advocate for those who are blind and have low vision since 1906. For more than a century, they have been an anchor in our community, located in Ward 7 at the intersection of East 101st and Chester. Mr. Benders, thank you. Thank you, Director. Uh, I am Larry Benders, the president of the Site Center, and I cannot tell you how excited we are all to be here. On this perfect day, White Cane Safety Day, how cool is that? And, and thank you, Director, for the partnership. Your team was over at the Site Center recently. We had a, a very good day together, understanding that our missions are aligned, our clients overlap, and we both exist to serve others, and that's a, that's a good thing. Today's program is called Access Your Abilities. And that's what we do at the Site Center every day. We try to dispel myths. We try to help people understand what might be possible. And you're gonna hear later from two professionals, Alicia Howerton and Tom Sawyer, who do this every day with intensity and passion and great honor. And I hope you will enjoy that. I am, I am the good looks that gets to start this thing off. Okay, so, um, all right, so. That didn't go over so well. Okay, so, um, all right, what do we do? The mission of the Site Center is to empower people with vision loss to realize their full potential while shaping the community's vision of that potential. As you heard, we've been doing this for over 110 years. We have 160 employees dedicated to moving our mission forward. And we serve all ages. We serve newborns to senior citizens and everyone in between. We have a team of optometrists, or basically eye doctors, that are professionals in low vision. We have therapists, we have counselors, we have employment specialists, the full range of folks that can help people with vision issues realize their independence. We use education, we use recreation, we use training and technology to help them be successful. And basically we help our clients optimize whatever eyesight they have. We do this in, in fun ways. We have sailing programs, we have water sports, we teach people how to have orientation and mobility. We have a baseball team, it's called Beep Baseball. So the ball actually makes a sound so that people can play baseball, it's amazing to see. We help our clients ride bicycles, go on hikes, nature excursions, fishing, horseback riding. All the things that those of us with sight take for granted. But we work really hard to make sure everyone has access to the same great stuff. But you know, it all starts with the white cane. For us, it's about independence. The first step in independence is being able to be out there on your own. White cane helps our clients learn how to travel anywhere, to navigate their environment with this cane. And, and, and the cane is used, and you've seen them if you don't use them yourself. Uh, it provides surface feedback to the user. You can tell what terrain you're operating on. It helps the user understand are they approaching a curb and what, what's the depth of the obstacle or how, what's in front of them. It helps identify clear paths and barriers for our clients and it gives feedback about the surface on which they find themselves located. So there's just, this is where it really gets goofy, like really, so bear with me here. 
because, as you heard, the White Cane Awareness Day came into existence about 1965 when Medicaid and Medicare became expanded from Social Security. That was uh, Mayor, uh, what was his name, uh, President Lyndon Johnson did all this. And at that same time, at the time in all 50 states, there was this thing called the White Cane Law. It started in the 30s, but it moved on to the 60s. The White Cane Law, and, the, and, and every state has it. Let me read you what Ohio's White Cane Safety Law is. The driver of every vehicle shall yield the right of way to every blind person guided by a guide dog or carrying a cane which is predominantly white or metal, metallic in color with, with or without a red tip. No person other than a blind person while on any public highway, street, or thoroughfare shall carry a white cane or um, a metallic cane with or without a red tip. So basically, if you don't, aren't blind, don't carry a white cane. You probably didn't know it's against the law to carry a white cane on the street. That's all. But the important thing to note, note the nuance. This is the white cane safety law in Ohio. And the, the law really is about to tell drivers drivers, that there's a person with a vision impairment ahead, give them the right of way. Yet there's a huge disconnect here in our work. We found that the White Cane Law, and it's not just Ohio, every state has that same law. Wherever you live, you take a, if you're going to be a driver, you take a driver's test, you have to understand this. But here's the disconnect. The White Cane Law is for the, for the understanding of drivers. Yet we know from our 110 years of work, the White Cane use it's for the independence of the user. It's not about identification or safety. It's how do they get around. And what you probably didn't know, maybe some of you did know, that vision rehab services in Ohio or nor anywhere else in the, in the country, they're not covered by insurance. So all the work we do helping people understand how to get from place to place, how to read Braille, how to use a computer, none of that's covered by insurance. And why is that? In fact, it's so mean, and that is the right word, when you look at, yeah, thank you, when you start looking at the regulations that I have in all 50 states, you look at what's covered by insurance. Let's see, let's say Medicaid. Okay, Medicaid covers, let's see, hospital beds, ventilators, crutches, wheelchairs, walking canes. Wait, walking canes. Read the law, the, the, laws, the Medicaid laws say walking canes except, I'm holding my hands up in parentheses, I'm making a statement, except the white cane for the blind. It is expressly prohibited at the federal level and in all 50 states. How wrong is that? And it's been wrong since 1965 and no one did anything about it. And clients, visually impaired folk or not clients, you've been putting up with this for decades and it's wrong. So. Me and my team from the Cleveland Site Center set out to change that. Yeah. We spent a lot of time in Columbus, a lot, working on educators, and, uh, ex uh, elected officials, senators, and house members at the state level. Not federally, so you're off the hook, okay? So, um, <laughs> for now, okay. So, we got them to understand how fundamentally wrong this is. Why are blind folk excluded expressly in the regulation? And we start telling that to people and say, this is wrong. This is really wrong. A funny thing happened. What the elected official does is first, they think they know everything. Oh, sorry. There are, anybody? Okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. Don't take that back to the office. Okay, all right. So, um, oh, sorry. In Columbus, they think they know everything. But here's what happened. So we said, did you know that the white cane isn't covered by insurance? And they didn't know that. And a, a smart person really hates finding out something they didn't know. So then, so they don't know that, they get angry, and then they get embarrassed. And they said, oh, I didn't know that. That's really wrong. And we say, yes, you're right, that's really wrong. And then they say, what can we do? <laughs> gotcha. We can change the law. You have the power in Columbus to change the law in Ohio. And that's exactly what happened. So effective January 1 of this year, the white cane is covered by Medicaid insurance. It's amazing, it's amazing. It's very exciting to be part of this, so it's covered. So, but that's not the end. That was, what's the famous saying, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. So, 
now the plan is okay, elected officials, remember us from the Select Center? You saw us last year and you put white canes covered by Medicaid in the hands of 30,000 people in the state of Ohio. That's really dangerous because we put those canes out there but we didn't teach anybody how to use it. Now so remember, nothing that we do is covered by insurance, so the training isn't covered by insurance. Right. So don't you think, Mr. or Mrs. Elected Official, we should also now cover the training for the white canes that you put in the hands of 30,000 people in the state? So that's where we are now. We're trying to get that done. So hopefully, hopefully we're successful, but we got a plan. We got a plan. And what I'm most excited about is that the Cleveland Site Center has been here for 110 years. We have the chance to lead the way for the nation and all of the constituents, blind and visually impaired people, whether they live in Cleveland, Cincinnati, Indianapolis, California, because we've shown the way. And I predict in the years to come, not only will the white cane be covered everywhere in the nation, but vision rehab will be covered as well. So wish us well. Thank you. So it's not all work and advocacy. Um, today I'd like to introduce uh, a group of friends of ours, the uh, Cleveland Site Center Steppers, um, who, who um, we've, we have assembled at great expense. The, uh, the June Taylor dancers were not available. If you, you know, so, so they're going to they're gonna do, a, a, gonna do a performance for you um, around the white cane. We wanted to have some fun with it, because it's not all rehab and, and laws. So um, as they get up, get set up, I'll uh, do some small talk while you get get set up, and um, let you know that this has been a, a real labor of uh, of enjoyment for uh, the site center to watch this come into play. How much time do you need? Well, you just go, gonna get set up. Okay, all right. I've been told they need a few more minutes, so I'd like to um, talk about my family vacation to Parma. <laughs> Actually, you know what, this is actually, uh, for, in terms of disabilities, back to this um, white cane law. This is how amazing, amazing um, reality is. When we met with one particular elected official, who shall be nameless, in Columbus, he said, um, you know, Larry, uh, I, I appreciate what you're saying, but I don't think a person who's blind is disabled. I went, what? This is, this is, honestly, this is like stunning, but this is how, this is why this event today is important, why disability days are important. Here's where, what we're up against. This elected official said, oh, I see folks who are blind or visually impaired with a guide dog, I see them walking across the street, I see them with a white cane navigating the grocery store. I said, Senator, with all due respect, what you're seeing is someone that has completed a rehab program and all the training that it took and, has the courage to go out and face the world. That's what you're seeing, sir. It didn't just happen. And that's why it's important that government step up and finance these activities so people can all live independently and fully. But that's what we're up against. And that's why your being here today is so helpful. So after today, spread the word. Talk to your friends. Talk about how important it is to recognize that we have abilities. All of us have abilities. Challenges to access your ability. And don't be afraid. Ladies and gentlemen, the Cleveland Site Center Steppers.
Center Steppers. I think you can figure out pretty quickly why we've had so much fun at the Department of Aging and planning this event. I just also want to do a shout out to Fred and Diane Desenzo, who Fred and his wife um, are volunteers at the site center and have been dance instructors. They're all over town, but they've been working hard the last eight weeks uh, together with the site center steppers, so we're delighted. So we're gonna keep this program moving. We've been entertained. We've learned a lot about advocacy and the power of each of our voices in our community. And at this point, I'd like to invite forward Alicia Howerton and Tom Sawyer. From the moment our planning committee met with Alicia and Tom, we became big, big fans of theirs. Their energy is contagious. Their willingness to collaborate is a model for all of us. They work at the Cleveland Site Center in community education and outreach, and we're delighted that they're able to join us now for a real learning session that we hope you'll take back to your communities as well. So without further ado, Tom and Alicia, thank you. Hello, everyone. There. Okay. I have a question for you. Did you know that by the year 2050 that the number of people who have vision loss will have doubled? They did know I put it on the screen. Oh. <laughs> what can you do to minimize your risk? So I'm Alicia Howerton, and this is obviously Tom Sawyer. And we'd like to introduce Vision Health to you, first of all. Let me turn this off. So, bad habits, does anybody have them? Oh, don't raise your hand. <laughs> don't admit it! <laughs> Blue light and why nutrition has two eyes, meaning I'm pointing to my eyes. So, any clue on what that might mean, that nutrition might be helpful? to your vision, to maintain it, to improve it, a variety of two things. So, five bad habits to change to protect your eyesight. Anybody smoke? You do, you should stop. The carcinogens are gonna, or whatever, cyanide, cyanide is gonna really affect your vision. And your skin. So. If you're not eating your veggies, start. Sedentary. If you're too sedentary, you're sitting in place, if you can just move your toe, move your toe. You need, to, you need to keep it moving. And you need to wear your shades. If you're supposed to wear glasses, wear them. Wear a hat if you're out in the sun. And staring at the screen too uh, long. So. Any screen, television screen, computer screen, your iPhone, your Android. Do the 20-20-20 method. 20 seconds, you, you're looking at a computer for 20 minutes, look away for 20 seconds, 20 feet away. So that's important because your muscles, your eyes have muscles. And so staring at the same distance all the time, that's part of the problem. The other part is that we forget to blink to hydrate our eyes. So those are important things to do. Uh, but blue light, uh, which is, well, first we want to do the recommended uh, eye exams. Oh, recommended eye exams. Anybody in here under the age of 64? If you are 18 to 64, you should be going every other year to get your eyes examined. Anyone over the age of 65? Yeah. <laughs> Not supposed to admit it. <laughs> you should go every year. And then if you have any kind of a medical condition, you should check with your optometrist, your regular doctor, and find out if you need to go more often or not. So we're gonna skip back to the blue, blue light. Blue light can be harmful, it can be helpful. But what one of the causes, is, we're gonna unpack this a little bit more in a minute, but one of the causes it can be, it can affect the cells in your eye, in the retina. So what happens is the cells die, and then you don't see in the central vision, just like macular degeneration. 
So there's good reason to pay attention to uh, some of the things that we're talking about here because everybody can be helped by filters and things like that, but we're gonna say, should we block all blue light? No, we need some blue light because it gives us energy so we can get up there and line dance. <laughs> okay, okay, all right, thank you. So, uh, sorry about that in the back. Stand a little closer. So, uh, so you could, research has shown that high visibility of blue light boosts your, uh, your energy. In, yes. Right? So. And it helps with your circadian rhythm That's so that right. you sleep right. at night. So filters are available either on your phone. If you have an iPhone, a yeah. new update just came out recently, I believe. A new update just came out. I wander. That's why she gave me another microphone. I apologize. So, so an update came up for your iPhones. But the Android, there's been uh, an actual app to turn to enable on your phones. But if you don't enable it, it won't work. You have to enable it. So go on to your settings and enable it. Foods to filter blue light. What are they? There are so many good foods for you that filter blue light, and they have lutein and zeaxanthin in them. And they, um, you know, bright orange, brightly colored vegetables and fruits and seafoods and. I can't name all of them, but I have a list. Yeah. So if you want one, just ask me. And it's out on the table there. The cliff notes are out on the table in the main area where you, just after where you signed in. We have a table that has a variety of different information for you. But lutein and zeaxanthin are, import, are important because they do filter out, but they should be in conjunction with olive oil or some other oil that's fat soluble because they're fat soluble. That, you have nothing in your eyes that will filter out blue light by itself. So it's either glasses or apps or things on your, uh, things you eat or on your screen filters. So it's important to take that into consideration of uh, doing all of those things to minimize that. But if you eat these things, xanthin and lutein, and spinach has, uh, like Lisa said, has lutein, it will filter as much as 60% of the blue light out. That's pretty important. Now earlier we said wear sunglasses and those types of things. But so you say, well, I'm wearing sunglasses, but it doesn't get in if you, if like my glasses right down or down on my nose a little bit. So the sun comes into there. So it's great to wear a visor as well, okay? So here's some foods that are the greatest value. And again, this handout's on the table out there. So there's kale, there's cress, spinach, spinach cooked, there's a different value. Peas, squash, green lettuce, Brussels sprouts. Somebody hates Brussels sprouts, don't they? <laughs> so, I'm sure there's lots so. of people do, but if you mix them with bacon, they taste really good. <laughs> oh, that bacon, <laughs> that's bacon. So, but that's another point that I want to finish this, the carrots and asparagus. But, Try to enhance your palate with some of these, knowing that they're going to be beneficial to you, so you don't have to uh, go through different things to how to learn how to see from your side view rather than your central view. You can minimize your risk by eating right, even if you don't like it. So here's some non-veggies non to help with. <laughs> so this is, one, we, we work with somebody who likes non-veggies. So uh, tuna, salmon, oysters, eggs, and blueberries. Eat a handful of blueberries every day. And frozen contains nearly, if not the same amount of new antioxidants as fresh. So there's no excuse to not eat them all year long. So there's spinach, orange, oranges. Now, oranges help a lot. They, they might be known as vitamin C. We oh, yes. That, so. Vitamin C. The letter C is also called vitamin C S E E. And if you're a JAWS user like myself, you'll ask your computer, okay, well, why are you saying it this way? <laughs> vitamin C is like vitamin C. So, so now we see. Now we see. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, I know. That was We've got a heckler in the front. <laughs> oh, man. So, uh, so we give what? Uh, we give hope for those who have vision loss or are blind. 
because you just, sometimes you just don't know what you don't know. Um, for many years, I didn't know about Cleveland Sight Center. You know, our mission statement is to help those that have vision loss to realize their full potential and shape the community's vision of that potential. Sometimes you just don't even know what your potential is. So we can help with that and giving people hope really does help. So you come to, you come to survive, first of all, this yep. is your story. Yeah. So, so. so you come to survive and, and learn what you can do and then you can thrive. Um, maybe first you just need to learn how to use a cane so you can get around your neighborhood or check your mail without uh, falling over a curb or something. And then once you learn how to do that, then you're like, okay, well, if I can do this, maybe I can do more. Um, and, and I did, I, a few years later, I learned how to use a computer and uh, never thought I could even turn one on, so, and, now here I am, talking to all of you, letting you know that we have hope for people. And you know, we've only been around for 113 years doing this, not me personally, I'm not that old yet, but um, that'd we be have, me. That'd be, that'd be me. <laughs> no, maybe cumulatively we are, but. So come learn how to survive, thrive, and then you can soar. I even flew on a plane. Well, I didn't fly the plane, the pilot did, but all by myself. It was phenomenal. So there are, there's really not a whole lot you can't do if you can't see. I say there's three things. One, drive, yes. Two, surgery. And three, disarm a bomb. <laughs> I'm surprised somebody in the audience today wasn't like a heckler I had one time. And he says, well, you could once. <laughs> yeah, well, <I> mean. <laughs> However, technology, technology's phenomenal. We're gonna touch base on technology a little bit, but because of technology, there will soon be autonomous cars. In fact, there's many of them already. And, but I still won't be doing the driving. There's robotics, so maybe I could do surgery. Mm, don't really want to. And disarm a bomb. So technology is a phenomenal thing. You just have to know what your abilities are and to be able to access them and just have the confidence in yourself to want to learn. There's so many people in Cuyahoga County that are sitting at home because they can't fill out paperwork for paratransit, because they don't know that they can turn on the coffee pot, that they don't know that they can learn how to do, take their own medicine. They don't know how to do so many things. And that's what we teach them to do. That's the survival that is this turning, st uh, turning step, turning stone, whatever, uh, stepping stone to get to survive because when we all learn that first thing, we are excited about it. We want to know what else we can do. What can I do now with it? If I can make coffee, can I cook a roast beef? It's the first start just for that. And when you survive, you say, then you say you thrive because I can do this, I can come to the sites and they can show me wonderful things that allow the, the whole world to me, not just the next step, it's the whole world. Because this came is the start of that journey. Survival, they've got to get out of the house to travel. That's one of the things. So after they do that, it, they can find all different ways to do things. There's, there isn't anything, virtually, that people can't do. There's nobody in here that can do everything without some assistance. Who didn't use the elevator today? There's all types of things. If we can learn to look and learn to understand people with different abilities, Stop looking at people with disability, not disabled people, by the way. It's people who are di have a disability, which is huge, because you're not putting them in that chair. You're not putting it behind that cane. You're not putting them in that prosthesis. You're showing them as a person, and you don't even need to describe them that way unless it's absolutely necessary. Nobody ever calls me Tom with the blue glasses or Blue Glasses Tom or something like that. I know that's trivial compared to what we're doing now, but it gets the idea across, so. People first. 
Tools, techniques, and tips to help you live well with vision loss. What are they? Oh my, there are so many. Um, high contrast Whoops. is really important. Oh, I'm skipping all that. So, proper lighting. <laughs> proper lighting. <laughs> So lighting's really important. Lighting can be harmful or it can be good. I'm going to have them do an exercise. They need to do an exercise now. Oh, okay. 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 Everybody ready? Now you don't need to get up. You don't need to do this thing. <laughs> but put your hands together above your eyes and you'll feel some of that strain going just away from, just from these lights here, right? So glare is a big culprit for lighting. Everyone says, I can't stand the light. It's really the glare. So if you get rid of that glare, that's right. So how do you get rid of that glare? You can use at lights, and you can put the light below your eyes, not above like these lights are here, or Well, when above, you're doing tasks. Uh, yes, when you're doing a task. I know in a room, that's not possible. But when you're at home, you're doing a task, have it below your eyes or behind your back. And don't sit in front of the window looking out the window yeah. when you're reading or doing needlework or any of those types of things or mechanically or whatever it might be, putting things together. Because the light gets in your eyes. That's where you can that's why when you don't have the light above your eyes, you're able to be energized by still being by the light, but it's not focusing in your eyes. So you can do much better with that. So below your eyes or behind your back. back. Yep. So if you're wondering if light's really helping you or hurting you to see something, you already own a magnifier, but you think it's the wrong one, on a sunny day, back up to a window uh, and put a paper, let the sun come over your shoulder, and put a paper by where the sunlight is and see if you can't see better. That's full spectrum lighting. And then that old magnifier that you had maybe still works with that lighting. So try that. That's, that's a very important thing to see if you need it before you go out and buy it. We have a store, we don't, we don't sell things to sell things. We offer things to, for sale for people who need them. We have hot lights, we have full spectrum lights. Contrast. Now contrast, really important. Um, if, if you're doing a task, maybe you're cooking and you're chopping onions, if you have a white cutting board and you're using white or yellow onions, they kind of blend in. So if you have a two-sided cutting board, one side's black, one side's white, flip it over and you'll have a black cutting board with a white onion, you'll be able to see it better. And you know, some people will say, well, I'm blind, I, it's not gonna work. Well, most people have some usable vision. So only about three to 4% of the blind population is without total vision. So we do that on a lot of things, but we, were, we didn't say something we should have. There's going to be a question and answer period at the end of our talk. Yeah. So, so just, we need to do that. That's why yeah. we gave you little note cards on there so you can write those questions down. So, yeah, so, so if you do have any questions, yeah. Okay. So not only the high contrast to help to keep things together, but the, what we do is we offer strategies, techniques, and protocols through our IL programs and different things. Let's say that a child comes over and says, Grandpa or Grandma, can you put this together? Oh, honey, we can't. And so Alicia talked about contrast, but also to pair with that, you may just take a little lid of a jar to put the small pieces in so you don't have to go all over. We teach techniques of how to sweep properly when you drop something, all different types of things. To really give a person that freedom and uh, accessibility. So let's go. Large print. Large print. Large print. Large print. <laughs> what? Three times? <laughs> Three times. Three times magnification? Yes. Oh, okay. Well, no, no, not necessarily. But large print. A lot of people don't understand what large print is. Most people think it could be, you know, 20 point font. But even if it is, you need to have the large print in aerial or block letters because people use all these fancy curly cues and script writing and not so good. You might think a, a TH is a four or an M, that kind of thing. So just, and, and large print could be different for one person to another. 20 point font is sort of average or 16. Mm -hmm. I need 80. So. Otherwise, I won't be able to see it. So large print, 
for whatever works best for you. So Alicia said that the TH may look like a four and probably people are wondering, how does that happen? Now, if you have macular degeneration or you only have small spots that you can see through, is that you will miss half the letters and you will try to interpret them as to something else. So that's why it's so important um, to keep clutter off and so things don't come because they migrate into a person's vision. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Visual clutter, yes, get rid of the visual clutter. And did you talk about the 10 letters? You always like to talk about the 10 letters in memory. <laughs> yes. In, uh, well, I, I talk about it in Braille. No, I don't think any word should be any longer than five letters because by the time I get to the fifth letter, I've forgotten the first one. So I don't know what my word's supposed to be. But in reading, you know, if you keep it to a minimum for a person who has vision loss of 10 letters or less, it's, it's easier to figure out. Right, right. So there's products that talk. Yes, audible cues for people, you know, talking watches. Does that mean I have more time to talk? <laughs> I'm done. I think we're getting the hook pretty soon. Okay. So, but all kinds of talking items. Clocks? And Clocks and uh, calculators. calculators and liquid level indicators that make a noise so you know to stop pouring so you don't pour the coffee everywhere and all those different types of things. Things that will talk to you and give you audible cues. So there's some more, and I was remiss at not putting the next screen, but there's the liquid level indicators, that orange thing with the tongs on the back. So we need to tell them what liquid level indicators don't really indicate what they do. Well, they indicate so. the level of liquid. There you go. And they make a sound. <laughs> so the audio yeah. labeler. <laughs> so we've got an audio labeler. Yes. <laughs> so what does that do? An audio labeler. You can, well, it depends upon what kind you have. But a pen friend, it's got like a little sticky barcode. And you put it on whatever you have. Maybe you have a cat at home. And you have tuna fish and a can of cat food. Who wants to eat a cat food salad sandwich for lunch? Not me. So you use an audio labeler so you can tell the difference. So our, one of our most favorite products that give independence. Yes. What is it? My cane. Well, besides the cane, one of our small products. Oh, bump dots, a low tech item. I'm thinking technology here. So a bump dot, it's a um, tactile uh, landmark, a uh, little screen. tiny dot, the and you can put it on just about anything. Uh, Tom says it's up on the screen. For oh, those right. of you can, that can see it, it's on the bottom right, and you can use them on your stove, washer, dryer, refrigerator, just about anything Jeez, to help yeah. keep you acclimated. Yes, two, two different keys. Might be very similar, you'll know if you put a bump dot on one of them, which one goes to which door. Magnifiers are not all created equal. There's no governing body that says a 3X is a 3X. So that's just one thing. So you can't just go anywhere and get to. Our optometrists have gauged what, the, what one of the magnifiers are as far as it's close to what is supposed to be a magnification, but other magnifiers actually Put on there. It's not that plus. It's not three times magnification. It's actually uh, diopter. Thank you, <laughs> diopter that tells that. So, but the range in price. And so, what we try to do at the Cleveland Sight Center is offer a range of different products to help people wherever they're at. So, we've got three different types of magnifiers, price-wise, that will help. Uh, but not only that. With the next picture is of, of different magnifiers. They all magnify, right? But what they don't, even though they may look the same, the one on the bottom left is a stand magnifier, even though it has a handle. And then there's a handled one that is for using per hand. There's a bar magnifier and an electronic magnifier. So legal blindness, the definition. The definition of legal blindness is 20 over 200 in the better eye with the best correction possible or the loss of your visual field and I'm holding my hands out to the sides, dropping my cane, bringing my hands forward to like looking through a straw. So does everybody know what average vision is? 20 over 20 is average vision? 
So to explain the difference, we'll say the back of the room is 200 feet away. So the person that has average vision can see the back wall and the people in the back row perfectly fine. So the person who's considered legally blind has to walk up and be no more than 20 feet from that 200 feet in order to see the same thing. And then there's many variables in between because of what is causing your vision loss. Like my vision, I say it's like looking through sheets of wax paper with blind spots. Maybe it's like looking through a piece of lace or maybe you've lost your central vision and you only see on the periphery or maybe you only have tunnel vision. So it just depends upon the person. Yes. yes. I have a son that's legally blind, and on the wall here are green uh, cubes. Could you show me what that is? Okay, the back is legal, uh, I mean, is regular sight, and then you said, uh, I'm trying to figure out what you're talking about when you say legally blind. How about if we talk after? Well, okay then. Thank you. We'll, we'll, we'll bring it up we'll in the bring question it up and in the, answer. Yep, in, in the, the questions question and, answer. and answers. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you. So, we can help. So, we have a dedicated staff to assist people. We have a dedicated staff to assist people in finding the best way to achieve their goals and objectives. So, if you're... Okay, so if you're having trouble, even with one daily activity, mm -hmm. you can call the site center and register. It's easy to do. Uh, there's cards out on the table with a lifesaver. The reason why there's a lifesaver on those cards, referral cards, and they're in a box out on the table, is because we give life impacting services to people. We change lives. Yeah. And you don't have to be legally blind. Just one task. Maybe you're having trouble reading. Maybe you're having trouble driving. So you don't have to be considered legally blind to receive services from us. So it's at the end we do the question. So, um, so assistive technology, there's all different types of assistive technology. There's things that, that are electronic magnifiers that will give you bigger spaces to see. Now, we talked a little bit about macular degeneration, about killing the cells in the eye. Does everybody understand what that is? No. All right. So, I'm not, so what it is is if you look at something, on the, if you see something from your peripheral vision, you will, you will see it on the floor, but then when you look, it will disappear. It's your side vision. So that's like, look in the mirror. If you can't see your face, maybe your nose, but you can see your ears or your shoulders, you're losing your central vision. That's how macular degeneration is. So there's basic magnifiers, there's electronic magnifiers. So well, you'll look up on the screen and see that 20, 20 degree angle of vision that you have and move the paper underneath the camera so you don't have to always be shaking your head from side to side. Try to find the best place to see from. Uh, and that's just one of them. And then if we go to the next electronics, it's called computer mediated reality. And it's a glasses that's wearable. And what that does, you go to your eye doctor and they map out where you can't see. And then that, and that computer, computer mediated reality, puts it in an area where you can see. So you're able to see those two different things. There's a whole, there's a myriad of different things that are available to help people understand where things are, locate things, just a just tremendous amount. I, I spend a few hours a week on LinkedIn posting different things for people that uh, might help them with vision loss. So it's, if, you, if you want to call us up, we can give you that link. If you want to find us on LinkedIn, you can call, my name's Tom Sawyer, please do that. It's way too much to talk about because I could talk about two days and all that stuff. It's true. It's all true. <laughs> All good information, though. So there's a couple of them that are on the screen now. There's a CCTV. There's a Cyber Eyes. That's a full Android tablet on the side of the screen in the middle there. Of the, and then the other one is Oculens. So that's the one that uh, will help you with that, what I was just talking about. All, all devices to help um, somebody with magnification. Access your abilities. Yes. Now, why, do we, why did we use that? Because it, it's accessibility. 
We're talking about accessibility, but access your access your ability. Um, what you have to be able to know where we are, so you can call us, or you can call us, so we can actually provide the services to help you get to access your ability. It's not just a uh, just do it from Mikey or something or from Nike. Yeah, Mikey. Yeah. Nike. Uh, so uh, not from Nike, uh, but just do it. Uh, so with access your ability. We want to help you do that, and you're the only one that can you can put those into place once you learn the techniques and strategies and protocols. So focus on your strengths and abilities. Understand how to use the things you have to achieve a better life and think differently about how you to accomplish what you need to do. Learn the fundamentals. We say, and I told my son this when he was learning the drums, he says, why can't I just rip it up? And I, and I said, you have to learn the fundamentals first to have fun. After all, that's the first three letters in fundamentals. That's right. And he rolled his eyes. <laughs> so a sighted guide. Sighted guide. Does everybody know how to guide somebody who might have vision loss? We had the city of Cleveland come to us last week and we had the opportunity to teach them. So I'm, let's see, who? I was going to demonstrate. I'll first tell you if somebody needs assistance, you ask. Uh, don't just assume that they need assistance because they're carrying a cane, but just ask them. And uh, then you would put the back of your hand on the back of their hand so they'll know where you are in their space because you don't want them groping you to figure out where you are. Some might, but not good. So um, then the person who has vision loss, maybe they don't even know how to um, be guided. So then you would help them put their hand above your elbow like a C. So I'm going to have Tom stand here yep. where you can see him. So he, I'm putting my hand above his elbow. And the reason for this is so that we're from his elbow to my elbow, we're in the perfect space so that if he stops, I'll stop before maybe he's going to hit a curve or there's stairs approaching or he needs to give me uh, good feedback, audio description, you have to, you, you cannot over describe the area that you're in, especially if your person is in a very unfamiliar area like this building. Um, okay, all right, oh. <laughs> you can still hear me. Close. All right, so we're gonna, I'm going to set my cane down so he can actually navigate me through the, uh, the area here. And uh, if we're going to go through a narrow space, uh, Tom would put his hand behind him and I would know to follow behind and he could tell me single file and that way I would know that we're going through a narrow space. And then he's going to place me in a chair because he's put his hand on the back of the chair so I can follow down and I'll feel where the chair is. And see if there's anything in the seat, and then I can seamlessly have a, a seat unless I want to run into something else and figure out where the table is so I can pull up and have a seat. And, Hi, everyone. <laughs> have lunch with these beautiful people. So that is how to guide somebody to a chair or through a narrow space. If you're going through a doorway, you describe whether the door door comes toward you or away from you if it's going left to right. And you can also use the clock method. Uh, does everybody know what an analog clock is? I'll bet you my friend Darian probably doesn't because he's so young. Um. <laughs> okay. So an analog clock. Oh. An analog clock is that circle clock, the big circle clock with the 12, the 3, the 6, the 9, all the other numbers too. But that's what we use for navigating. So um, our wonderful sight center uh, line dancers, the steppers over here, they're to my 3 o'clock 
Uh, or no. Huh? <laughs> 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 The other I'm, three. The other three. But I'm also left right challenged, so, <laughs> so they're at my nine o'clock, and uh, Tom's to my about five o'clock because the person who's blind or has vision loss is always at six o'clock. Even if he's behind me, he would be at my five o'clock. And Ivory, she's um, signing here, and she's at my seven o'clock. So use a clock method for describing where you are in a room. And not mm -hmm. only where you are in a room, what's on your plate, mm -hmm. where yeah, things are, yeah. who is at the table and what, where they're at, not just at my right to the left, two people over, because that's not the same as uh, uh, establishing a value, a placement value for the person. So you do that also. You're on a walk. You're not delivering a package somewhere. You need to be talking to the person. Yeah. Now, you may have noticed that I looked ahead. I didn't talk much because we're mic'd, but normally I would be saying things. But when you do that, most people have a tendency to turn around, and then you're both walking like a side crab. And that's not good, because <laughs> then you'll both be walking into something. So it's important to uh, be uh, very informative, because how would you like it if you were paired up with a person for like, 20 minutes or whatever it is, and they didn't say a thing to you, they, they, nothing at all. They didn't tell you anything, they didn't do anything. You're opening up a world that people may not see. Past 10 feet, past two feet, whatever it is. Now, Alicia, we tell this story because we actually do this a lot, believe it or not. And uh, uh, she tells a story about not seeing her whole hand in front of her face. And 10 feet out of her realm, uh, out of her eyes view, she can't see virtually anything so it's very important so if I tell her that the hydrangeas are in bloom because I know what she likes we spend about 30 40 hours together a week and so we'll go over and feel the hydrangeas or smell and see what they smell like all those things open up a world to people so it's very important so we physical techniques we showed you auto describe audio describe so clock method and then over, over, you can never over communicate enough. So this. Somebody has a question. We need, the question yeah. and answer session is yeah. going to be coming up. So. Coming up in just a couple minutes. Write your question down so. if you have a question. Uh, just, you know, you can't just wave. You need to say, hello, this is Tom. Say your name when you're in a group at a table so they know who's talking, especially if, they don't, if you don't know all of the people. Or say, Tom, I have a question for you or whatever. Uh, do you need help? We already talked a little bit about that, but there's one thing before, do you need help? Because we don't just see a cane and say, do you need help? We say, let's look and see if the person actually does need help before we go ask them if they need help. If they don't look like they need help, because they can be, and many are, competent, confident, competitive, and contributing human beings to society and not just some white king. So gestures, don't use gestures. What yeah. kind of gestures? Talk to me. Shrug my shoulders. I have no idea if you're shrugging your shoulders or shaking your head yes or no. What about, did you see the game last night? No, because I was sad. Who I knew who was going to lose. <laughs> But I could have watched it. And I may watch it differently than you would, but yeah, I could see the game. I see Tom's pocket square today. I'm um, a white cane. I'm dressed in white cane I, today. That's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, so, Sometimes he is my white cane so, when uh, I don't have yes. mine. But now C can also be used wrong. Yeah. Did you just see that? No. No. <laughs> That's a different C. That's a different C. Because yeah. they, they didn't hear it. If it was, you could hear it, they're seeing it by hearing it. Or, so there's a different C. So uh, audio describe everything. Uh, but loud noises can be very uh, distracting. Yes, right, good. And uh, if there's a commotion or whatever, that's, uh, you need to describe yeah. that to the person. Yeah, let well. people know. Maybe there's a, a bunch of commotion. You hear people running or whatever. Let somebody know, you know, well, you know, a tree just fell or whatever it might be. So we need your help. We need your help to be the ambassadors mm -hmm. for us. Yep. Many, we were just asked yesterday, and how do we reach people who are in their house? 
I say we reach people that are out of their house because the more people we reach, the more people will tell other people. Yeah. We're asking you to tell other people that there is life impacting services, that to be a client, it's just one daily activity, that you call up, so you'll talk to people, they'll get you going where you need to go. So we watch her because Alicia, you didn't tell I, that story. Yeah, I um, did not know. I've been legally blind for 40 years. The first half didn't know about Cleveland Sight Center and its services. Would have made things go a little bit smoother. I'm not saying easier, but a little bit smoother. I might have done more than I, ha I have in the past. I might have learned how to use a computer way sooner and been able to be more independent. So please tell somebody about our services. You, you can't really rely on even the medical field. It was an eye doctor who finally told me, but I waited 20 years for someone to say, hey, there's a place out there that can help you. Even though you're losing your vision, you still want to be able to do all the things you want to do in life. Even if it's just make coffee and watch the game. You know, doing all those things. Maybe you want to do more. So tell somebody. Be our ambassadors. And if you want to learn more than just an abbreviated version, call us and give it. Alicia actually gives most of the tours. So we'll be glad to give you a tour at our agency. Yep. So just give us a call. Questions and answers. All We're right, going to answer questions. this question over here first. We had, right. one, we had one in the beginning. So. We, we need to take one other one first. Yes, oh, okay. so the, the 20 feet over 200 feet for low for blind, legal, legal blindness. Yeah, I was trying to distinguish. Um, in some instances, they'll put down that he's blind. And in other instances, they'll put down that uh, he's blind. Uh, Low vision? Legally blind. Right, right, yeah. mm -hmm. right. Because he has a cataract in one eye, and they just told me that this two months ago, and all these years, I didn't know that. Right. So the, the, the question is, is there's a variety of terminology used by different doctors. Legally blind, blind, could even be low vision, mm -hmm. because if your vision is 20 over 200 for your eye doctor, it, with the best correction and the better eye, then you are legally blind even though you can see yeah. and use your vision. My vision, if you want to put a number on it, is about 20 over 3,000. Even though I can still see a little bit, I'm still legally blind. Because I was trying to get as much help uh, with this sight as I possibly can. Call that number, 216-658-4567. And, and we have the, yep, the Lifesaver card has the number on it. So do you have resources for deaf with Usher syndrome and KP blindness services for deaf blind? Yes. The short answer is yes. Mm -hmm. So one of our case managers yep. specializes. So, is that, is that good? Yes. Yes, sir. Well, I don't mean to be rude. No, no. you're fine. Uh, I have what you call for death. Are you familiar with that? We are a non-medical rehabilitation facility, and I am sure that our rehab people and our optometrists are familiar with all the different types of eye diseases. So that would be a question for them. Call Not, in. Get, call call in. in. Yeah. Thank That's you the best much. way. You're we very can, welcome. We can, only give, we can only give you kind of a half an answer if, it, if it, that much. At best, so, yeah. So, yes, another question. What about SSPs? Do you have any SSPs oh. there? An I'm S sorry, I'm I don't, sorry, know, what I don't know what an is. SSP is. Uh, a person that signs and they're working with someone that's deaf, they have like a guide person. Um, and they can sign and take go places with them when they need to go places. Like they go food shopping. We don't personally have any. Compa companions to uh, deaf blind for getting around, going through places, signing and different stuff like that. Thank you. Yes. What, what uh, geographic area 
Oh, I'm so glad you asked that. I can tell you alphabetically. <laughs> Okay. All so, right. So, so we, uh, we need to repeat the question. You okay. The question is, uh, what is our coverage area, and do we provide transportation? The coverage area is nine counties as far as adults go, children, um, more counties than that, Ashtabula, Cuyahoga, Geauga, Lake, Lorraine, Medina, Portage, Stark, and Summit counties. The um, transportation we do provide for a uh, minimal fee for a low vision exam. And then there are a few programs that we provide transportation for, uh, for um, a minimal fee as well. But always call, uh, we can help get you hooked up with uh, RTA paratransit or other way means of uh, getting around. Back in here. Yes, ma'am. Oh, hi. Hi. My, my name is Sharon. Hi, Sharon. Um, I don't know if this has to do with this, but um, I'm in a class now. I'm learning sign language okay. to, to maybe to help people. Okay. All right. That's so we had, we had a comment by a, a lady in the front table uh, saying she's learning sign language to help people. So we thank you for that. So, uh, question, Cecil. Yes. We have that group over here. I hear it. It's picking up that more Okay. So uh, I couldn't hear all your questions, Cecil, because it's uh, the room and everything. But eating nutritious food, things that I'm talking about, that we talked about, are very important to eyesight. But general health is very important, too. So just for general health. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Do you go to people like that in a church groups, uh, schools, to go, you know, to go and talk? Because what you're saying here today, um, I can see it could be used yes. almost okay. everywhere. And there are people who, like this lady here, have been around for a long time, and yet the answer, you have the answers, and she did. She right. did. Right. Yes, so. so the question is, where do we go out into the public and speak about what we're speaking about today? And the answer is yes. Uh, we speak to senior groups, churches. We even go to second grade classes and teach people. We teach blindness basics to uh, first responders, police departments, uh, physical therapists, occupational therapists. Uh, teaching people how to interact with those who have vision loss. So we, we try to uh, be progressive instead of passive in talking to people yeah. and letting them know about our services. I must tell you though, we're stretching a little bit because we're going to do our first kindergarten class <laughs> in December. <laughs> oh boy, they're learning about the five senses. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Um, when you were talking about the clock method for uh, telling people directions like 12 o'clock, yeah. 3 o'clock, do I, which side, am I using my right hand? Oh, um, Tom wants to answer, but yeah. just remember that the person who has vision loss is always at 6 o'clock because, you know, I'm saying over here is 3 o'clock. No, I was using my left hand, and <laughs> sometimes I'm challenged that way. But. So why I whispered in her ear, let me answer that, because she usually has me run around in a clock all around, and I get dizzy. <laughs> so uh, I, I just want to be careful. And it'd be kind of hard to run around in the room to show, but all so. So just remember though that at the six o'clock, the person with vision loss is at six o'clock for everything. Even if you're sitting at yourself telling her at 12 and that her food is at three or the other three, uh, that's very important. So always know that's be, and if it's behind at five o'clock, I, I step, I step back, it's at five behind. 
And I know where your voice is speaking to me from. So right now, you are currently like at my 10, 11 o'clock. Right, right. right. That's great. For me. So any anything else? Yes, back here. Oh, yes. Tell us, Shirley. Camp. Also have a. Yes, we do. Yeah. Uh. Uh. So, talk, let, I'm gonna let Alicia talk about. It. Okay. Well, we have we have everything from children's services, early intervention, birth to three years, at preschool. Uh, TVIs, which are teachers of the visually impaired, which go out into the community and help your child be mainstreamed into public schools or private schools and do all the things they need to do. We have orientation and mobility specialists. We have daily living skills. We have a low vision clinic. We have a store that sells over 800 products for those with vision loss. We have um, computer training. We have recreation. We have a, a Share the Vision program, which is a peer-to-peer -peer mentor program to help those that have accepted their vision loss, uh, help others who are going through vision loss, who are new to vision loss. We have TLC, Transitional Life Counseling. It is tender loving care because it helps you in a, a group figure out how you're gonna do things. And most of all, we have recreation and camping. Fun stuff. Fun stuff. And recreation can be the stepping stone for somebody who's losing their vision, learning how to accept their vision loss, because so many people are not self-identifying. And our camp has been around this past summer, 91 years. And it's only one of two in the nation. But that, it does have bathrooms. It does have bathrooms. And you don't have to sleep in a tent. <laughs> and it's fun. And you do all kinds of things. And it, it's, it's a place not just for kids, but adults as well. And as a matter of fact, that's what it was originally in purpose, was for adults. For adults. And just this past weekend, we had fall weekend. And in February, February 7th, 8th, and 9th is a winter weekend. I'll let you know now. Mark it on your calendar. Tell, tell them a little bit what are the fun stuff things you do, the yoga, the book discussion. Oh, OK. And, and for recreation, every Tuesday, we have line dance. You could become one of the team up here and be one of our sight center stubbers. We have crochet and yoga. That happens every Tuesday. Then alternating Tuesdays, we have music group and chess, adaptive chess club and game day and movie and popcorn day and, and book discussion. I mean, and, and then there's going to be so much more. Our rec specialist, Vince, is putting together other programs and Fred and Diane, our volunteers that helped choreograph this song, they're gonna come back and teach us so yeah. salsa and, and yes. um, ballroom, what's the, ballroom, ballroom dancing. dancing. So, <laughs> gotta come get your rec on. Yes. 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 What I wanted to tell you about Hybrid Lodge, I'll start all over. I've been going there 30 years <laughs> taking my son. He's a 60-year-old. And um, he learned to play the drums at Highbrook last year. This summer at Highbrook, he got down with the music, playing drums. And I'm getting him a drum. And the one thing I really like about Highbrook is it's the one place that he can walk other than in his house by himself. They have these pipes and they have these um, wires. Guide wires. You can go all, well, I, I, I done got so used to saying wires. Guide it's okay. wires it's that okay. you can uh, hang on to. He can go from the lodge through the woods and back by himself holding on. And the other year we got lost. Now I have vision, but he brought me back. <laughs> All right, thank you. Yay! Thank you.
thank you, Tom and Alicia. Please give it up for Tom and Alicia as our education and outreach experts. Thank you. If you haven't been to the Cleveland Science Center, you must go. The Idea Center and what's in there, the way they have it all designed, we learned so much there. And I know I left um, with the challenge to share this with other people. We know that as we age, our vision um, decreases. And so vision loss will affect likely all of us as we age. And so it's really important to know about this resource in our community. Before I invite up Councilman Conwell, I wanna just point out a few things in your resource bag. A couple things that are really important. So in your bag, there were pre-stuff some things. One is a purple magnetic file of life. I wanna challenge everyone here to take this home and fill it out, ask someone to help you fill it out, put it on your refrigerator. And if emergency services professionals need to come into your house because of a health emergency, they're gonna know your name, they're gonna know your emergency contact, they're gonna know because you put it on this sheet where, who we should call about your pets, they're gonna know where the key is to lock your house, they're gonna know all the information about you on what's called a file of life. The reason there's two of them is because if they take one, you've still got one. We have lots of copies at the Department of Aging. We'd like every Cleveland resident to have a purple magnet on their refrigerator called File of Life. Um, for your safety, for your care by emergency professionals. The Division of EMS helped us create that. They told us the questions to, answer, to ask. We would have never known that if you have one of those emergency call buttons and you push it because you've fallen, it keeps beeping while you're, until it gets turned off. So if you put the number down on the company you have, they'll call that company and tell them to turn it off so that they know you've been attended to. So file of life is one thing. Secondly, with the chill in the air today, winter unfortunately is right around the corner. We wanna make sure everyone that's eligible signs up for the Home Energy Assistance Program. It can feel like a daunting application, but I often tell people that if you're eligible, it's worth about a $300 credit on your gas bill. We wanna keep everybody safe and warm this winter season. If you need help filling this out, we do this all day at the Department of Aging. For fun, I wanna invite you on October 30th, on behalf of the Cleveland Clergy Alliance, to Cavs Night Out. So the Cleveland Clergy Alliance has secured more than 2,000 tickets, free tickets. The flyers in your bag, if you're free that night and wanna see the Cavs beat the Bulls, come on down and uh, we're working with them to provide some transportation from our resource and recreation centers. Uh, Congresswoman Fudge is a part of it, the Western Reserve Area Agency on Aging, DSAS, so the flyer is in there. We'd love to have you be a part of that. Lastly, I just want to do a plug. The census is coming. March, April of 2020 is when we'll enter into the census season. This happens every decade. We want you to start thinking about it now because participation in the census is vital so that we can continue to ensure the important services like Medicare, Medicaid, SNAP, Social Security, public transportation, for those services to be funded for those who need it. Without an accurate census count, those services might not receive the necessary funding to meet everyone's needs. The 2020 census aims to be accessible for everyone. You can respond online, by phone, or by mail. The online questionnaire is in 13 different languages and features an ASL video guide to assist users while responding. For paper questionnaires, braille and legal print guides are available. And for in-person responses, there will be census takers who communicate in sign language. We want to ensure that you know that any information you share is protected by law and cannot be used against you. I wanna say that again, that any information that you share with the census 
is protected by law and cannot be used against you. So that bag, I hope are, those are just four of the important things in there, but I hope you picked up more as well. At this time, I'd like to invite forward uh, Councilman Kevin Conwell. 15 years ago, he initiated this event. He's been a council member since 2001. He represents Ward 9, which includes the neighborhoods of Glenville and parts of University Circle. Councilman Conwell has championed economic development in his ward, and he's been a vocal activist on social service issues, advocating for families, adults with disabilities, older adults, and the unemployed. It's always a pleasure to work with him. So Councilman Conwell, please join us. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Quick. Like to her. Let her know. I'll do that every year. He's he's finger spelling his whole name to um, our uh, Sarita. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I used to. Uh, I think I used to do what you do. With me? I, uh, oh, you know, I think I used to interpret a long time ago. Oh, maybe. Way before I became a council member. So. Uh, that gave me an up close view and a genuine concern and sensitive ear to uh, understand what's going on. Hey, what's up? What's going on, brother? Yeah. A body, a body. A body guy. A body guy. Yeah. Yeah. It's very solid. Come on, do it. I'm young. Where were you not, man? No, your brother is from Tanzania, right? And so he speaks Swahili. And. Um, Around Tanzania and Uganda and Kenya is um, our former president that we miss very dearly, Barack Obama's country. Right, right. So he's been to. Right. So when I see him, we 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 exchange greetings with um, Swahili and Sa uh, uh, and Gapi and Dugu Rafiki Yangu. You know. Right. The time it is. You say, yeah, my brother in Ngoma. Come on, yeah. So uh, I used to be kind of fluent in Swahili. Matter of fact, I used to even dream in it some time in Swahili. And I did that as well as the sign language and some Spanish and all those kind of things. I mean, you have to be able to switch up and do a lot of things. Um, this piece here, it benefited me a lot. Like I said, I used to interpret um, uh, for the deaf. And I had a program that I um, would help people to um, get jobs that were uh, disabled at Goodwill Industries. And it opened my eyes and it taught me about giving back to help. So when I, on time when I became a uh, legislator uh, in city council, uh, I worked with my good friend, Mayor Frank Jackson, to legislate disability awareness luncheon so they, it could, would help our other council members to understand about the abilities and not the disabilities. And, um, because our job is to write policy, and we bring home the policy so that we can help make life better for uh, all people. And sitting back here right now, it, um, I was able to listen to the issues and the concerns. I think that, um, Tom, it would be nice for you probably even to come to um, city council and talk about it with us, because you know we're putting some LED lightings and and the other things that, that we're doing, because we can write policy. The job, really, of a council member is to write policy for people that live, work, and travel through the city of Cleveland. That's our job, is to write policy. But if we don't have an understanding, and if we don't know about some of the policy or how we're hurting you, and we don't have an up-close view, um, then we can write policy that can, um, that, that can hurt you. So having someone, our representative, to come to um, city council to talk with us about it um, will help out a great deal. Because one of the things about being a councilman, the councilman is the closest to you. And the councilman can touch you even more so than the president of the United <coughs> States of America. Did you, have you realized that? We write laws about like um, your, your ramps, disabled ramps. We write laws when we do street resurfacing. We write, we write laws about lighting and street light maintenance. We write laws about how the police can treat you. It's your city council. We're the ones who do more government than anyone. We sit there and we write ordinances. 
But we have to have an up-close view about what's going on so that we don't hurt the residents that we truly love. And, and I mean that from the bottom of my heart. So those things mean a lot. So when we came up with Disability Awareness Luncheon, uh, council member, um, he was a council member at the time, he's the mayor now, Frank Jackson, wanted to continue it. So I want to give him a round of applause for uh, continuing. And I always come here, um, you know, dress up when I come, but I was busy in my ward um, doing uh, some ward issues. You know, I had a house fire to deal with on 110th Street. So uh, we had no fatalities there, but uh, I had to go in and, and help out with, the, um, with my residents. So uh, I meant no disrespect like this, but anyway, I got the mighty, mighty Tower Blooders shirt on anyway. <laughs> Glenville Tower Blooders. And everybody want to be a Tower Blooder, you know, a Glenville Tower Blooder. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. Everybody want to be a Tower Blooder. Everybody want to be a Glenville Tower Blooder. It's very important. Um, I sat back and I heard some things and I, and I listened to your to your questions, he, he had a question. Just show me how to. You don't have to look into, um, I know we deal with um, certain disabilities. You know, I mean, you know, we deal with the deaf, um, the police officers, they have training how to deal with that. They also have training on how to um, uh, um, deal with mental illness. But um, are you guys working with us with the blind? I used to be the chairman of some, some. Well, um, you know, Tom, I'll give you my number. You can reach out to me because my ears are open. As I mentioned about policy to pass on, um, we could do that. And, and here's the other thing. Even if, Tom, you work with us, things change. So we, we have to um, always um, 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 have a relationship with you so that we can try to make it better. But with that police department, but you know what? The thing that we're missing uh, with the police and is, is community policing. If we had more community police officers to walk the beats and walk the streets and visit the site center or, the, uh, or uh, other key stakeholders and partners, then we would have a, a more better up close view, but I wish we had more community policing because then they can walk and they can talk with a lot of the residents, not even just the site centers, but the residents, and it will help us out more. Because you know, training is always ongoing. It's a, it's it's an ongoing uh, thing you got to constantly train. So I'll I'll bring that up and and I'll talk with Tom. I'm interested in coming to your um, site center. You're not in my ward, right? You're not in Ward Nine, Barcia Jones. But you're in my wife's district, correct? My wife is the county council rep. So if you reach out, Tom, I'll, I'll come over and, and I'll do whatever I can do to help. And Dougal. Yeah. Um, I, I think you know, what we've learned here should be in the education system because it. It is in the education system, like uh, science, reading, and, and, and you know, now you have kids who are sort of blind literacy. And if that is possible, I think every family, including people who think we are sighted, we are not really in one way or another. And what what Tom was putting down on the end, on the board here is essential. Is essential. Uh, thank you, Edu and Dugo. Um, when we first started the uh, Disability Awareness Luncheon, uh, Mary, we uh, we had a contest for children. The first one. We uh, work with the schools, and the children were right about what you're talking about, believing in, in the abilities and not the disabilities. And then they would write poetry, they would write um, an, an essay on it, it would get them to start thinking, and we moved away from that. Uh, we should 
bring them back into it. And then the children came and they would do their poems and poetry because we would say who won the, uh, uh, the contest and we would give them uh, uh, an award for it. Because that way it made them more open to the culture of dealing with um, the, the um, disabled or, or abilities, whatever the case may be. So I think we should, we should go back to that. I forgot all about that. I forgot all about that, but we should do that. That's, that's important. In the schools, if the parents aren't doing it, if some parents are making their children aware to the sensitivities of others and with their health and disabilities, but if you do it in the school, um, the preschool, and regularly do it as a curriculum, that that's a mandatory curriculum with fun and, you know, like a, awards for uh, poetry, uh, so, you know, singing, you know, music and stuff t towards that, then that would help uh, decrease uh, the bullying uh, towards others who who they feel are not their equal. And that would make it more sens has more sensitivity and love. And maybe that will contribute to the decrease in violence towards others and that would be showing respect if that was continuously done not like uh, black history month once a year but that should be something curriculum throughout the school year you talk about a program is that yeah, correct the sensitivities of others with uh, disabilities development the delay because they're they're mainstream into the school system you, you know, I have a and, the, and the blind and, and, and you know, just a sensitivity. I understand. I have a meeting with uh, Eric Gordon. I'll bring it up to him. Uh, it's next next Monday, Friday, 16th. He, he's at Glenview on the Home of the Mighty Mighty Top Letters. So, uh, <laughs> I have a meeting with him before Friday, 6th. What I could do, could you just trigger it? What's your name, ma'am? All right, you just triggered it. Uh, I'll talk with him, get back with Mary McInerney, and then we'll get experts, and we'll talk about that, having some, um, uh, maybe some programs. And you're right, that could, and I never thought about that. Sensitivity training, sensitivity training. Is that happening? Is that happening in, in, in Ohio? Is sensitivity ongoing regularly? Decreasing bullying, showing love, so we won't have the suicides, we won't have crimes and stuff like that. Right. That's, you know called, that's, a, that's a awareness, you know, uh, depression and, and, and different things like that. So, you know, that people can reach out and help and love and, and, and put others, and, and we have programs and poetry and, 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 and you know, music and song. And, 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 and stories and, and, and put it together ongoing. All right, two things I'll do. I'll talk with Eric. Um, you gave me a lot. I have to think about, um, we'll bring an expert in. We can bring an expert in, Tom. And uh, maybe a white paper or something like that. Yeah. And then we can present it to Eric, because I don't know where he's at. I don't know what Eric Gordon's doing about it, but I have a to-do list and I'll talk with him about it. And then, so you won't think I'll just put your question aside, um, you give it to, uh, okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah, 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 then we can, uh, Mary McInerney, she's a great director, and then we can address it, and then we can address it next time we meet here. What did the councilman do? Did he talk with him? What are the outcome measures? Because what you don't want to do is just say something and you don't, you don't do the outcome measures. But that is, you're right. Because a lot of times, uh, the children, they will, uh, they'll bully. They'll bully. And, and I don't want that to happen. Councilman, just for timing, would you be willing to read off the winners of our gift cards today? We have two Dave's gift cards. Uh, from the mayor's office. Uh, and, and, and I didn't, and, and I didn't he didn't pick it. these names. I didn't pull the names. So this came when you checked into registration. They were added to um, a drawing. So the first name is Robert Kehoe. 
Robert, it looks like maybe Kim? Kim. Robert Kim? Bob. 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 All right. Congratulations, congratulations. Okay. The next person is Tammy Christmas. Tammy Christmas. Look where Tammy Christmas at. Jeffrey Christmas, man, that's a cool name. <laughs> so we, we can, we'll get that to Miss Tammy. So it, right. Councilman. But, but, okay. All right, I'm gonna go, but <laughs> let me say this about musician mode. I really did with what you guys brought up, because that's always been on my mind. Let me, and let me say this, like the councilman is the closest to the people, and then it's my job to take back what you just told me. And I, I didn't even think about that with the bully piece, you know, and, um, and the reason why. And, and if they are uh, this kind of program or something to work with them, then when you cut back or the fights or whatever the case may be, because the children don't know. They don't know, and they sometimes they can be mean and cruel, but they don't know why. And I'm trying to think, trying to figure out what's going on with that, but then you open my eyes and mind to it, and, and I write policy. I love to write policy, and, and when you talk with, um, with people, and let me tell you, let me say this real quick. When the councilman, talks with his bosses, because you are the boss, you're the boss of the council member, all the way up to the President of the United States. But the councilman talks with the mayor, he talks with the um, 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 Eric Gordon, and I even talk with the governor. I'm, I'm, I'll meet with him on the 25th, I'll meet with him on the 25th about some issues and concerns. My wife and I will be at the governor's mansion, I've never been there, so that's special for me to be there. So, but I'm gonna bring that up as well, because we'll talk about bullying because Governor Mike DeWine and his wife, they, they, they're in the family a lot. So we can discuss that too, but sometimes we're so busy we don't think about what you just brought up, but it helps us out with policy. With policy, mm -hmm. and I'll bring it up to Eric Gordon as well as to, um, as well as to the governor. And one last thing, don't let them say they don't have the money. Okay? I remember you. Yes, yeah. don't let them say it, okay? They got the money, work it out. Oh, we can work that out. Because you know what? You know what? It benefits them because what the school don't want to do when they do suspension is always a cause and the conditions of why suspension is happening. But if we can get in there to figure it out why, then we can come back on suspension and you can have more children there for their ADA, especially ADA week. Yeah. It's important that it, it is done because you know you have a time bomb ticking and it is going to your cost of ticking every day and it possibly will go off and those it needs to uh, it needs to be addressed because you don't want to you don't want it to hit the fan. Yeah, that bullying is not cool, man. That's not cool. Uh, I'm gonna turn the you mic know, over. Right, right, right. We can do prevention. Prevention is definitely the key. And Councilman, would you be willing, I know more people have their hands raised, but would you be willing to stay around a little bit and talk individually with people? I will. Okay. So we want to, get, uh, over the thing. You want to so, so we wanna, for those who need to leave, we know that we've come to the one o'clock hour. We're so grateful you spent your lunch with us. We hope it's been informative. I want to just turn it over as we close to Fatima Perkins from the Western Reserve Area Agency on Aging to synthesize the day for oh, us. Synthesize, okay. Well, for starters, I have to say it's not always about Glenville, <laughs> but it is truly about the mighty, mighty Cardinals of Shaw High. <laughs> okay, okay. Can anybody dispute that? <laughs> okay. Okay, so I have the mic last, so ha <laughs> ha. Okay, so first of all, I agree with this young lady that was talking about classes and civility. In the state of Ohio, it is mandatory. This is, something's going on with this. It is mandatory that high school children take financial education. So why is it not mandatory that they take some sort of literacy, some sort of civility 
classes or did that be integrated into the curriculum? That's very important. So I wanted to say that. Also, Larry, I wanted to say kudos to you and your team because I don't know if people understand the advocacy work that it takes to change something in Medicaid. That's a really huge. And it's, yes. And it's a testimony to your wisdom and patience because whereas others would have been protesting against the elected official, what you did got the better outcomes. Mary, I want to thank you and your team and partners. You've done a fantastic job as usual. Thanks for inviting the area agency to this wonderful event. It's a pleasure to partner with you through the Aging and Disability Resource Network. The area agency has many programs like Family Caregiver Support, diabetes self-management, and we also do adult vision screenings where we learn about folks who are literally very close to losing their sight over something like cataracts that they can have surgery for, okay? So we love to do that, and we've gotten over 200 people free eyeglasses, but the state calls it spectacles, okay? So Mary mentioned the history of this campus, the building being in the shape of an anchor. The anchor is one of my favorite symbols. Why? Because the anchor represents hope. It actually means finding trust, expectation, and something you want to happen. So in closing, I am going to say this. When you call the partners that were here today, the Cleveland Site Center, City of Cleveland Department of Aging, the Aging and Disability Resource Network, National Federation of the Blind, Ohio Library for the Blind and Physically Disabled, you expect help and you will receive help. And on that note, I'm going to say our number is 6210303 the Aging and Disability Resource Center. And when you call that number, you will get help because we're for everyone. Ladies, there you go. That's my team in the back. And with that, I'm going to close. Thank you.